Oh gosh. That it can be chemical imbalance, it can be a blood pressure issue, it can be so many different things. Yeah. Chemical. Question? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Usually chemical. And for many different reasons. You know, that's, that's one of those hard to answer questions because there's so many different reasons why it could be. You know, it could be structural issues, it could be chemical issues, it could be pressure issues, it could be side effects of something else. So, okay, so ventilation and perfusion. What the heck does that mean? Respiratory system. What are we talking about when we talk about perfusion? Yeah. And or movement of what to where? We're on page uh, 826. Right, so we're talking about blood flow, movement of gases from the respiratory apparatus into the circulatory system and movement then of those same gases from the circulatory system to the tissues. Yes? So, when we talk about some of the mismatches, it has to do with not being able to set up those pressure gradients. So when you look at these two diagrams, ventilation less than perfusion, versus ventilation greater than perfusion. What's going on? Decreased ventilation and or increased perfusion of alveoli causes local what? Increase what? If I, if I create an imbalance in pressure gradient, an increase in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and partial pressure of oxygen. I'm going to mess up what I saw in the diagram before. Yes? I'm going to mess up what we saw in figure 22.17, this diagram here. Yes? So this talks about some of those imbalances. <clears throat> Remember, we have nervous system who's going to help to auto-regulate, regulate blood vessel diameter regulate blood flow, regulate with respect to the respiratory system breathing rate that are going to help to balance out those differences. But when an imbalance happens, we're going to have problems with exchange. So when I have a mismatch of ventilation and perfusion, decreased ventilation and or increased perfusion is going to mess with the gases, partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So what's going to happen to help equalize that pressure? The blood vessels are going to do what? And what's, a, what's that going to do? They're going to, pulmonary arterioles serve these alveoli, will constrict, narrow those tubes so that we can equal out ventilation and perfusion, air coming in versus air diffusing into the circulatory system. The opposite will happen when ventilation is greater than perfusion. So in order to have proper exchange at the alveoli, what are the arterioles going to do? Rather than constrict, they're going to do the opposite. They're going to dilate so that we can match ventilation and perfusion, air coming in versus air being distributed to the capillary beds. Okay? Yes? 
That's what that talks about. Now, transport of respiratory gases by the blood. So who, who's responsible for transporting respiratory gases? <laughs> yeah, most of it's going to be carried by red blood cells. Not all of it, though. And when we talk about respiratory gases, don't be fooled. It's not just oxygen. It's also who? Carbon dioxide. So oxygen, much of the oxygen, is going to be carried on the red blood cells, but not just the red blood cells. It's going to be carried in blood plasma as well. So when we talk about transport of respiratory gases by blood, think oxygen and carbon dioxide transport. It's a very chemical thing, the picking up of oxygen, the dropping off of oxygen, and the picking up of carbon dioxide, and the dropping off of carbon dioxide. So different factors are going to influence this chemical reaction of picking up carbon dioxide and oxygen and dropping off. And that's what they talk about next. Um, when oxygen is being carried on the hemoglobin molecule, how many oxygens can I carry on a hemoglobin molecule? Four. Remember when we looked at hemoglobin when we discussed blood? It was a globular protein, four different groups of proteins with what in the center of each of those groups? What was that called? It looked like a little frisbee. The heme molecule, okay? So heme, a globin, heme is what's going to help carry the respiratory gases. What's the center of that hemoglobin molecule? Iron. The center of the heme portion is iron. So when hemoglobin is carrying oxygen, we call it what? Oxyhemoglobin. Okay. When we drop off oxygen, what do we call hemoglobin then? Deoxyhemoglobin. And what do we call hemoglobin that now carries carbon dioxide? Carb amino hemoglobin. Okay. Just know those terms. Carb, amino, hemoglobin. Exactly. And we're not going to get crazy about the chemistry. <sighs> We're gonna talk. We're gonna talk about the chem. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna talk about that when we see when we throw those red blood cells up there, and we're gonna look at the process of the chemistry of the oxygen saturation curve. Do we need to know all the like carbonic acids and the carbonic Yep. We're gonna we're gonna talk about those for sure. A couple of definitions I want you to know some of the disorders. Homeostatic imbalances on page 829. So again, a basic definition. Anemic hypoxia. What's hypoxia? Low oxygen levels. Exactly. So if you're anemic, hypoxia. What is that? Because? Not enough. If I don't have enough iron, I don't have enough what? Hemoglobin. Okay, I might, and, this, and there's a whole bunch of different situations that might happen. I might have enough red blood cells, but I don't have enough hemoglobin in those red blood cells. Usually it's the result of not having enough red blood cells. What's ischemic or set stagnant hypoxia? There's something blocked. It's not, the blood isn't able to flow to those areas. Histotoxic hypoxia has to do with an a, imbalance in metals. Metals? It could be metals, yeah. Also, um, things like cyanide, for example. It could be chemical. Hypoxic, hypoxemic hypoxia. 
and that's the ventilation and perfusion issue. Yeah, and it's usually usually related to some sort of cardiovascular disease. Carbon monoxide. Why is carbon monoxide such a big problem? And we're going to talk about this in a minute. Is it because um, carbon monoxide uh, has uh, affinity uh, to uh, hemoglobin? And what's that mean? Exactly. The attraction. attraction. Remember, it, it, when I think of hemoglobin molecule in the respiratory system, I think of hemoglobin as sort of like a, an amusement park ride, where oxygen and carbon dioxide get on, but then they have to get off. If they don't get off, I can't carry other respiratory gases. If the affinity for the molecule is much too strong, if carbon monoxide takes up all the seats, on my hemoglobin molecule. My hemoglobin molecule can't drop anything off and can't pick anything up. So carbon monoxide poisoning is dangerous because of the fact that that carbon monoxide is stuck in the seat, one of the four seats that a hemoglobin molecule has to carry respiratory gases. It'll hold on much, much longer than a normal carbon dioxide or oxygen molecule. You die, exactly. Yeah, you can, you'll have to very, very slowly get rid of it. So if you're just starting to feel the effects, it's going to take a while for that dissociation to happen. It will eventually. But you have to get as much oxygen into your system as possible to try and dissociate the carbon monoxide from the molecule. It's going to take a while, Does that too. Happen? I've never heard that getting well, if you, if you start to feel the effects of it, and what's going to happen to you when you start to feel the effects of carbon monoxide in, in your atmosphere? Tired. The, that tired. So if someone catches the fact that there's carbon monoxide in the environment and they get you out of that environment and put you into a normal atmospheric environment. That would help make it faster. And it depends on how many of your molecules have been inhabited by carbon monoxide. So it's the degree at which Could be, it could be a whole bunch of different things. Um, for example, your car. Car? Yeah, because sometimes your exhaust system is, is leaking into your automobile. Could either have the system is not able to dissimilate? I don't, mm -hmm. I don't have the answer to that one. But it, he might be under a different situation where he's getting exposed to more carbon monoxide than the rest. You know, maybe, or one of the things that gives off carbon monoxide is different heating systems too. So where in the where in the house, if it's a house problem, is my bedroom sitting above the source of the carbon monoxide or is it not? You know, so it depends on all kinds of factors like that. Wasn't there a lot of that during the ice storm? Yeah, and generators and things like that, or trying to you know use exactly, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it can kill you. No, this. What is this diagram? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Say what? You need heat. It's extra heat. Why not? So, carbon dioxide transport is also important. Besides oxygen transport, carbon dioxide transport is important too. And believe it or not, carbon dioxide levels in our body are important to maintain to maintain the proper chemistry of our body. So they talk about the fact that dissolved in plasma, 7 to 10 percent carbon dioxide is transported just in plasma. Chemically bonded to hemoglobin, about 20 percent. And again, when, when hemoglobin is saturated with carbon dioxide, what is it called? Hemoglobin is saturated with carbon dioxide. 
carbamino hemoglobin. So this is on page 829 in your textbooks. So we see carbon dioxide attaching to hemoglobin creating HbCO2, carbamino hemoglobin. The other thing that's going to help transport ions is buffers in our bodies. So when we look at the chemistry of transport of respiratory gases, we talk about buffers. And one of the buffer systems in our body that's going to help with the transport of respiratory gases is our bicarbonate ion buffer system. So the other form in which we will see carbon dioxide in the body being transported in plasma is in the form of bicarbonate ions in the plasma. Yes, but there's a whole bunch of different ways we're going to see it being transported, not just one way. Okay? So it can be in plasma as it is, as a carbon? Yeah, just like if we were to look in the environment, we would see it in different forms as well. So bicarbonate ions in plasma, about 70%. So most of the transport of carbon dioxide is in the form of bicarbonate ions. One of the really, really important tests that are done, anybody work in the emergency room, patient comes in, what do, what do you order for blood tests? Uh, Routine. What's in a metabolic panel? Uh -huh. Ever hear of electrolytes? Yeah. Sodium, potassium, chloride, and bicarbonate ions. Yes? So that's a real common, easy way to find out if metabolism is doing its thing, is to look at a patient's electrolyte levels. And with respect to carbon dioxide, we look at their bicarbonate levels. So that's one of our important electrolytes to look at. One of the um, chemistry parts of this I want you to know is the reaction that you see on page 829. So carbon dioxide and water in blood plasma, that's page 829. Yeah, it's kind of what's up there, but this is the reaction that we see, the chemistry, the chemical reaction. It's in there in a bunch of different forms. So CO2, carbon dioxide, and water, and this is a reversible reaction, so it's going to depend on the concentration, right? is going to create something called carbonic acid. That dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. So when we look at the circulatory system and we look at some of the ions involved in transport of respiratory gases, the concentration of acid is important with respect to the transport of carbon dioxide because when we have more carbon dioxide in the system, what are we going to create more? Acidic. Acidic. Now, what's one of the things that's going to determine whether or not I get on or get off the ride? The hemoglobin pH. So the concentration of carbon dioxide is extremely important to help maintain the proper acid balance in our body. These buffer systems are responsible for helping to maintain pH balance in the body as well. But oxygen and carbon dioxide levels are going to affect this reaction one way or the other. In chemistry, when I add something to one end of a, of a reversible equation, what happens to it? Well, it pushes it to the other side. So in this reaction, if I add too much carbon dioxide to this equation, what am I going to end up with? More carbon dioxide. Well, would be more bicarbonate ions. E eventually, but we also have more what? Hydrogen. More free hydrogen ions. What's going to happen to my pH? It it's going to drop and become, become more what? Acidic. Acidic. So too much carbon dioxide in my system can create an acidic environment. What will happen if the opposite occurs? I know it's a waste gas, but if I don't have enough in my system, 
what's chemistry going to do? Because no, what's going to happen? Because the equation will be the opposite now. So and pH. Add, Tell me what's going to happen to pH. pH is going to rise. Correct. It will be more alkaline. Correct. And disruption of pH is going to disrupt chemistry. OK? <coughs> so again, you know, people think carbon dioxide waste gas. But remember, there has to be a fine balance. So if I don't have enough carbon dioxide, for example, when would I not have enough carbon dioxide? <laughs> Anybody ever hyperventilate? Yeah. <laughs> breathing out. Too rapid a breathing. Breathing out too much carbon dioxide too quickly. What's that going to do to your blood pH? Not enough carbon dioxide will make it rise and turn you into your environment into a what environment? Blood. Think blood. pH. pH rising. What is that? Basic. Basic. Okay. That's called respiratory alkaline alkalosis. That's going to start messing with this chemistry the movement of these molecules from one place to another. So not only does a change in pressure drive the movement of molecules from one place to another, but so does chemistry. Did you have a question? Yeah. In this process, because there's a two-way how uh, uh, bicarbonate ion can be made in a plasma and in slow process, right? Correct. In the red blood cell. Correct. But Well, no, it's going to be in the red blood cell, but you, again, it's going to mess with the distribution in plasma versus red blood cell. But, but that's my question. So hydrogen in the plasma or hydrogen in the red blood cell, can Correct. And remember, that's going to change cellular yeah. metabolism. Both of them will change? Well, it depends. It depends on what's going on. If I have too much carbon dioxide within the cell, it's going to become a more acidic environment. If I don't have enough carbon dioxide within the cell, it's going to become a more basic environment. But when will we draw You don't look at inside the cell, do you? No. No. Where do you look? Plasma. Plasma. But you're going, to see, you're going to see a reflection of what's in the plasma eventually giving us what's happening inside the cells. Because these are molecules that are going to diffuse across the plasma membrane quite freely. Okay. So it'll be, a, it'll be a representation of what's in the cells as well. Okay. So we're not talking about sodium potassium pump, which is going to give us a totally different so outlook. Exactly. Okay. So you're going to, does it make sense? Yes. Makes, does everybody? Understand what just happened? <laughs> okay, so this diagram I like because the reason I like it, big arrows, it shows us the chemistry. I'm a visual person if you haven't figured it out yet. So oxygen release and carbon dioxide pickup at the tissues. We already talked about the fact that there's a pressure difference. There's a difference in partial pressure. That's one of the things that's going to drive the movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Yes? But what's the other thing that's going to drive the movement of these molecules? Chemistry, concentration. So carbon dioxide, so we're at oxygen release and carbon dioxide pickup at the tissues. We already went to the lungs. We picked up our stuff. We're talking about at the tissues now. So remember, there's a difference in partial pressure. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide is higher in the tissues than it is in the what? In the plasma. So we see the big blue arrows pushing more carbon dioxide from the tissues into the what? What's over here on this side? That's in the plasma. That's in the blood. 
when we increase the amount of carbon dioxide at that level, that chemical reaction that we just discussed, carbon dioxide plus water, is going to create acid. It's going to create carb, what's that acid in the middle? Carbonic acid. And that's going to dissociate into bicarbonate ions and hydrogen. Also, chlorine is going to be involved here, another one of your very important electrolytes. So we're going to see what we call a chlorine shift, and that's going to help with the rest of the chemistry that's going to go on within the cell. The shift is also going to allow us to get oxygen and do what? What do we want to do with it? We have to <laughs> kick oxygen off the ride, don't we, at this point? And that's the second part of the reaction here. So we are dissociating oxygen from hemoglobin. We're kicking it off the ride. And what's going to happen with oxygen because of the partial pressure difference? It's going to move from the plasma into the big red arrow that way. Yes? If the chemistry is messed up, if those reactions don't take place properly, properly because of a chemical imbalance, I can't have proper exchange at the tissue level. So pH, due to a lot of the reactions we see in that diagram, if they are too high or too low, are going to mess with the chemistry that's going on at the tissue level. Yes? Yeah. But that's the, physiology. yeah, in interactive physiology for the respiratory system, you have one, yes? I mean, you, I used that for the last chapter. Yeah, I love them. That's one of the reasons we chose this test book many, many years ago was because of those. I think they're one of the best study tools. So what's happening here? Now we're in the lungs. Again, chemistry is involved. Of course, we have the partial pressure. We have the concentration. All that stuff is driving us, but so is the chemistry as well. So oxygen pickup, because of what? Why does oxygen go from the alveoli into the plasma at this point? Because partial pressure. Yeah, partial pressure, partial pressure differences, yes. I have trouble with P words these days. So they come, oxygen comes in, dissolves in the plasma. When I add oxygen to this reaction, now I'm going to help kick who off the seat? I'm going to kick carbon dioxide off the seat. So we're going to get on the seat as oxygen, the hemoglobin molecule. And that interaction is going to create the reaction going in this direction so that we're going to kick carbon dioxide off the seat. And where is it going to go? It's going to go into plasma. And then because of the differences in partial pressure, what's going to happen? Yes? Do you understand this? That's the chemistry I want you to understand. Just a quick question. So the chloride is what pretty much after the first one. <coughs> yeah, and you'll see chloride. It's going to help with this part of the reaction. The creation of the, or the incorporation of chlorine is going to help with the bicarbonate ion hydrogen for, carbonic uh, acid. Substitution for uh, bicarbonate ion. Correct. OK? So that's another reason why this exchange takes place in the way that it does. So remember, not only is the hemoglobin molecule important for transport, but we also have it inside the cells. We have it in plasma, bicarbonate ions. The majority of the carbon dioxide carried is going to be in the form of what? Bicarbonate ions. 70 percent. Very good. So oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. <gasps> Does this chapter ever end? No. <laughs> <laughs> so on, um, on page 
8.30 and 8.31, we see a discussion of oxygen dissociation. Again, I can get on the ride, I got to get off. Yes? If I don't get off, it's not going to do me any good. If my hemoglobin molecule can't let go of oxygen, it's not going to do me any good. If it can't pick up carbon dioxide, it's not going to do me any good. So what the dissociation curve looks at is some of the different factors that affect a get on the ride, get off the ride. Do you ever, am I confusing you by get on the ride? Uh, okay, good. <laughs> but hopefully they, they give you a, a visual that will make you understand what's going on. It's hard to describe things at a molecular level when you can't see what's going on. All right, so percent oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. Can we, can we at any point have 100% oxygen saturation? Yeah, it's hard to do that. It's hard to get everybody on the ride. So 98, boy, it's awesome if you hit 99, but you don't typically see that unless you're doing what? Know, putting a, a putting person on an oxygen mask, exactly. So from our atmosphere, if I'm hitting 98, I'm doing a good job. And some of the different things that will affect the oxygen dissociation curve, who gets on and who gets off, is temperature. What's the optimal temperature for oxygen dissociation? Ta, 98.6 or 38 degrees, 37 degrees is Celsius. Optimal is actually 38 degrees. Is blood a little bit warmer than the rest of our body? Yeah. Huh. Makes sense. So 38 degrees, that's optimal temperature. What's going to happen when it's too hot? And, I, and this is, again, go back to the to the ride. What's going to happen when, if the wheel's moving too fast? <laughs> Everybody's going to go flying off, yes? I thought it would stop. No, no, they'll go off too, too fast. And too fast isn't good either. What if I get off the ride before the ride stops at the place where I want to get off? Is that good? That's not good, yes? Too high a temperature. How about too low a temperature? What happens to molecules? No, yeah, and me not getting off the ride. It's better for affinity, but that's not good when I want to go, yeah, because then I'm not getting off the ride. Molecules are moving too slow. So as the temperature lowers, the affinity for the molecules increases, but that's not necessarily a good thing because I'm not getting off the ride. Remember, I have to get off in order for it to be good. So the optimal temperature, 30 degrees Celsius, is where we see the, you don't like them? Oh, percent. It's a partial pressure. Yep. Same with the top one? Yep. So it's partial pressure of oxygen in millimeters of mercury. Why is that a problem? That's because just the way it is. Because chart you're supposed to just look at it and say, now I see why. you got to really think about this. Uh, so sense. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> you have to think about this one a while. So what's the second um, chart showing us? A shift in what? Yeah, and what did that affect? pH. So is pH going to affect oxygen saturation? Yes. Where's optimal? What's your optimal blood pH? 7.35 to 7.45. What happens if pH is to what? And that's a tight range, isn't it? What's this? It's a acidic 
acidic. Everybody's going to what? Get off the ride too fast. What happens if I'm in the basic end? What's going to happen? Everybody's going to hold tight to their seat. Yes? So that is your oxygen. I know it should be obvious and evident. Hopefully it's a little more obvious and evident right now. Yeah. This line is the best line. Do you know what I mean? Like the one in the middle, this is best, but we can't tell why that's best. Yeah, but if you go and you look at what um, percent oxygen saturation of hemoglobin, if you're at here. Well, you would think 100% would be awesome. You can't do 100%, though. Physically, you can't. Okay, so what if you're right here? Huh? You do it all the time. Oh, you're good. Follow this along. Which line follows it the longest? This line. Go do it up there. Okay. Well, it's going to follow it the longest. So this is this one. Follow, this one follows it the longest at that at that point. See it here, up there. Just the constant. Yep. You good with me? Believe me. So in the textbook on page 832, understand the different influences on pH the carbon dioxide has, understand carbon dioxide transport, understand acid production, understand pH and temperature and how they affect that oxygen saturation curve. So nervous system controls respiratory system. Who? The the medulla and the pawn. So brainstem regions. You learned this last semester when you discussed the nervous system. Yes? Yep. You talked about how those were, were going to affect respiratory rate. And again, respiratory rate is going to be controlled by messages from brain regions that are going to send messages to these areas to control respiratory rate based on what? Hmm? What kind of chemicals? And the ones we just talked about, carbon, carbon dioxide, oxygen levels. Basically, we're not measuring carbon dioxide and oxygen levels directly, but we're measuring chlorine, bicarbonate ions. You getting the point? So those guys that were involved in the reactions that we just talked about, those are constantly being monitored by your central nervous system. And those are going to affect breathing rate directly by centers, the pontine respiratory center and the ventral respiratory group, the VRG. The ventral respiratory group. And that's the guy that's going to drive output, basically, basically help with the rhythm of your breathing rate. These are going to send messages to who? Who, who is it that causes you to breathe? Lungs. Yeah, those guys that can create that difference in pressure. So the messages are going to be sent via these guys to things like the external intercostals and the diaphragm to help control respiratory rate. The other diagram I like better is this guy because it tells us what happens when I don't have enough oxygen and I have too much carbon dioxide. These are the guys that are going to pick up the messages, chemoreceptors, and they're going to send messages to this region to either speed up or slow down the breathing rate depending on what the chemistry tells us. So we have chemoreceptors in brainstem regions. We have chemoreceptors in peripheral blood vessels. 
So some of the major blood vessels that are sending blood through the body. We have control from higher brain regions. Cerebral cortex has areas that are going to control breathing rate. And all of them are going to communicate with who? All those arrows point to who? Those two regions in the pons and the medulla oblongata. Um, Why is it you, can, you can't blow up your lungs? I can't do it anymore. Why? Yeah, those stretch receptors in your lungs are going to hit a certain point and they're going to stop you from breathing in. Exactly. Yep. So all of those different reflexes are going to help control the amount that I blow up my lungs and then decrease their volume. Well, it's, but it's, not oxygen, right? it's, it's, going to, it's going to send messages based on those levels. But not oxygen. Hold on. Well, it's based, on the, it's based on the metabolites of all the chemistry that we just discussed. Okay, so uh, if I have a decrease in oxygen, I'm going to have an increase in carbon dioxide and an increase in hydrogen ions and an increase in acid. So that's what I'm measuring because of that. Does, does that make sense? I'm just trying to understand. Uh, which it's not directly measuring oxygen levels, no. It's, it's measuring what? Right, and that's because of? This one. Exactly. Yeah, but see, a uh, central uh, chemical receptor doesn't have uh, oxygen. No, no, because bo even both of them, they're all looking at those hydrogen levels, okay? Mm -hmm. So they're all measuring that. And remember, I'm going to have an increase in those levels when I have an increase in what? Oxygen. Carbon dioxide. Oh, exactly. So it's kind of an indirect measure. Unfortunately, sometimes it kind of backfires because sometimes my breathing weight rate will increase even though I want to hold on to some of the gases that I'm breathing out, you know, like in my, in my hyperventilation. What do they have you do when you hyperventilate? They have you breathe back the air that you just breathed out. Why? Exactly, because the air that you breathe out isn't 100% carbon dioxide. You can't possibly absorb all of the oxygen molecules from the air that you breathe out. But the percentage of carbon dioxide is increased in the air that you exhale, because you're exhaling waste gases. There's still oxygen in there, too. So when you breathe in something that's higher in concentration of carbon dioxide, when you're losing too much carbon dioxide, that's going to balance out your chemistry. It's going to even out chemistry. And those messages are going to even out your breathing rate. So hyperventilation will uh, decrease carbon dioxide levels? Hyperventilation will increase carbon dioxide levels. Well, hyperventilation will decrease, but breathing in the bag is going to help increase. Hyperventilation, think about it, I'm breathing out too much. I'm breathing out too much what? Carbon, carbon dioxide. So it's going to decrease carbon dioxide levels. What's it going to do to my pH? Shift that reaction to the opposite. So when I hyperventilate, what do I go into? Right, because I'm breathing too much out. So what's going to happen to my pH? It's going to go up. Going to go up. No. No, rise. No, rise. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, because, you know, remember the pH thing? Yeah, it's confusing. When I have too much acid from too much carbon dioxide, when would I get too much carbon dioxide? Hypo. I'm not breathing out. My breathing rate is too slow or too shallow. Now I'm doing the opposite. 
I have too much carbon dioxide in my system. What's that going to do to the reaction? Opposite. I'm going to make too much what? I'm going to make too much carbonic acid, which is going to dissociate into those hydrogen ions. I'm going to become more acidic. So think breathing. Increased CO2 equals increased what? No. Decrease pH. Right? When I decrease CO2, I do what? And yes. Okay, so when you breathing? So think about breathing. If I'm breathing out too fast. So when I breathe into the bag, correct, more carbon dioxide, so I can help balance this out. Yes? So even though it's a waste gas, the, the balance of it is extremely important for a chemical balance in our bodies. Even though we're getting rid of it eventually, if I get rid of it too fast, that's going to disrupt chemical balance. And that makes sense, because think about it. If I couldn't deal with it at all, how would I grab onto it and get rid of it if my body wasn't used to having a certain balance in there? If that makes sense. Whew. So, changes in uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide and blood pH regulate ventilation by a negative feedback mechanism. Again, the concentration of these chemicals in our body are going to help regulate breathing rate to make sure that breathing rate stays at a point where the chemicals will stay in homeostasis or in balance. So that's basically reiterating the same point that we just talked about. So brain important sending impulses or receiving information from the peripheral nervous system regarding what's going on with respect to chemistry in the respiratory system. So we're going to get information from sensory receptors in the peripheral nervous system from things like major blood vessels that are just leaving the heart, which makes perfect sense, yes? Because that's where hopefully I've picked up oxygen and I've dropped off carbon dioxide and now I'm sending this blood to the whole system. So it would make sense that I have receptors right there that are making sure that the concentration of carbon dioxide and oxygen are just right. And those are going to send messages to the central nervous system for processing and then the central nervous system via the brain stem is going to regulate breathing rate based on chemical balance. Yes? All right, this one is a bone of contention with me. <sighs> Respiratory adjustments before I get on to this one. Exercise. When I start to use up too much oxygen and generate too much carbon dioxide, I'm going to have an imbalance. And that's going to have an effect on what for me? Breathing rate, exactly. So they talk about hyper what? Hyperpnea. And what's that? In response to what? Metabolic. It's not on this diagram. So <laughs> She's like, that's like nothing. Yeah, no, no. So increased ventilation in response to metabolic needs. So when my muscles are using up more oxygen and giving off more carbon dioxide, basically this is saying that I'm going to increase breathing rate and the metabolism associated with gas exchange. Altitude. That might be a problem because of what? Yeah, exactly, that pressure difference. Remember, I have to set up that pressure gradient. If I don't set up that pressure gradient, 
the exchange isn't going to happen as fast. So when I go to a higher altitude, what do I do to the partial pressure of the gases in my atmosphere? They lower. People say, there's not enough oxygen up there. There's plenty of oxygen up there. What's the problem? Because why? It's the partial pressure differences in the atmosphere. So the differences, the pressures are lower. We're not going to have as readily an exchange because we haven't set up as huge a difference in partial pressure gradients. So that's where the problem is. High altitudes, hemoglobin affinity for oxygen is reduced, and it has to do with the chemistry that we, are, we discussed earlier. So our bodies can adjust to that as we go up into higher altitudes. It's tough when we go up there really, really quickly. We'll have trouble breathing. We'll get tired faster. This describes homeostatic imbalances of the respiratory system. And this number blows my mind. When you leave class today, I want you to Google up a few numbers so it can blow your mind too. Those of you who work in healthcare have probably dealt with, and those of you who are going to work in healthcare are going to deal with patients that fall into the category called COPD, which is what? Chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, things like asthma and emphysema, if you look in your textbook, chronic bronchitis, lung cancer, tuberculosis, that's a tough one, because that, that one's kind of a nasty little critter. It's in first place, all right. Look at the first sentence. More than 80% of patients, 80% of patients, that number is staggering to me. Because just for the hell of it, I want you to go and Google how many patients in our country at this time have COPD and multiply it by 80%. Not only, not only patients that smoke, secondhand smoke. Even now, the rise of asthma and newborns and Because they're living in households where parents do what? So they're not smoking. Their parents are smoking. Yeah, and they're breathing it. 80%. You have a choice, oh, 80% with COPD. You chose to have COPD. Yes? That blows my mind. So. Make you happy that you're not smoking anymore. You know, I know. <laughs> Who smokes? Nobody. Nobody will admit it. <laughs> I used to. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, but I mean, this is scary. And not being able to breathe, have you ever gotten into a situation where you weren't able to get? Hyperventilation. Yeah. It's scary, isn't it? But it's that 80% of people that have asthma. How much of that percentage is because people like me get stuck in the car? Exactly. You're in that 80% too, exactly. used to have a choice, but I didn't have a You didn't. But your parents did. Correct. But your parents made the choice for you. Yeah, and they do. They do. They do heal a lot. But you still have the, uh, you have long-term effects that will, may haunt you when you get older. the damage hasn't been done. Exactly. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if you stop. You've already done it. So what's the best? Well, it's, it, it depends on what, well, it depends on what point you get. If, if, you know what I mean? If he had stopped 20 years ago. He did, but he had smoked for 30. Right. So, you know what I mean? Like, what, yeah, you did 
But is he better off if he had continued to smoke? No. Right. right. I mean, no, so. of course not. But I'm just saying, like, it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, and my mother will probably end up with it too, you know, yeah. and it's just unfortunate. It is unfortunate. You know? It is. So what's the best advice you can give anyone? <laughs> a young person. Don't start. Don't start <laughs> ever. Mm-hmm. But it is not allowed in any of the houses. It's not allowed. Like if the kids are in the backyard, you're to go away. Yeah. Right? Go in the woods. Go away. Here Correct. I don't want to even smell it. Yeah. yeah. And it is. It's a ch you know, and especially nowadays where where we know that this is not good for us. But I think that's kind of the issue. When you decide to start smoking, it's not such a huge deal. It's a casual thing. It's right. And it's, an, it's, it's highly addictive. And that's the, that's the, that's the advice, don't start, right. because it's highly addictive. Sometimes even people get more addicted to smoking than to the alcohol. Right. Because they don't know what they're doing. Well, it is a drug. I mean, it's a drug, but it's their breakfast. It's their dinner. Like, my yeah. mom will always have coffee. Coffee, one hand, cigarette, yep. hand. Always and a lot of the, the habit of smoking no. is... It's not necessarily the smoking. No, it's just the it's a social It's a, it's a, it's a, what's the thing I want to say? My brain is not. It's the social interaction. It, and it's the physical interaction. When I quit, I always had to have a lollipop or mm -hmm. a pencil or a pen. And certain places you associate with smoking. Yeah. Right. And again, it's it's your body. It's it why does one person get cancer and one person not? Right. You know, I mean, is yeah. it genetics? Is it environment? Is it something that happened when they were younger? It, you know what I'm saying? There's so many other factors involved well, in development of COPD. Yep. Yep. And then you have somebody who's, you know, a young person um, who develops lung cancer or some of these other diseases associated with COPD. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Related to respiratory? Well, well, no, it was related to last chapter, but I learned a lot about it this weekend. I wish I had learned about it. Before. Yeah. It was just crazy. So, just a basic definition of COPD, uh, all, all of these different things that can be lumped into this category. Understand, you know, that bronchitis. What's the difference between bronchitis and emphysema, dyspnea, difficulty breathing? And then when I disrupt the balance of carbon dioxide and, and oxygen, what am I going to disrupt in the body? I'm going to disrupt my body chemistry. I'm going to disrupt pH and disrupt metabolism in general. So respiratory gases are extremely important, and their concentrations in the body are extremely important. Tuberculosis talks about a nasty little bacteria called Mycobacterium tuberculosis, um, spread by coughing on other people. Lung cancers <laughs> associated. Uh, we have three different types. Adenocarcinoma, about 40% of cases. Um, in peripheral lung areas, squamous cell, 25 to 30 percent, um, form masses, and then small cell carcinoma, which is the most, the nastiest of all the uh, lung cancers, about 20 percent, uh, can cause all kinds of problems as well. So that is the end of the respiratory system. Don't worry about developmental aspects. And we have finished the respiratory system.
All right. Who's next? The digestive, the digestive system. <laughs> well, because in the digestive system chapter, there's a couple of things ju besides just the digestive system. Um, if you notice in the digestive system chapter, um, when we hit page 892, we're actually talking about the chemical part of digestion the physiology, talking about carbohydrate, protein, fat, and nucleic acid digestion. And then, in the next chapter, which is also lots and lots of fun, nutrition, metabolism, body temperature regulation. Um, did anybody take biology before they took this class? Yes. We're gonna talk about cellular respiration. Yep, we talked a about it a little bit. We're going to talk about it in much more detail. Not in all the detail that the book goes into, but so the next couple of chapters, they seem very long, but we'll be fine. So basically the digestive system, what is it? <laughs> What's it for? Make big things? small. That's what it's for. We're done. Digestive system. Any questions? Oh, no. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah, it would be good, wouldn't it? So the digestive system is a series of organs that takes in large particles of food and makes them small enough to absorb them into the circulatory system for distribution to the cells. So when we look at the anatomy of the digestive system, that's what we're going to see. A tube that starts here and ends back there. And in the process, that tube is going to process the foods that we ingest. So when we start, another name for the um, digestive system is the gastrointestinal system or the alimentary canal. And that's exactly what it's there for make big things small. It starts at the mouth, and we have accessory organs of the digestive system that are gonna squirt things in the tube as we go along. We start right at the top of the tube, squirting stuff in for the digestive process. In order to have chemistry take place properly with digestion, it's gotta be in a liquid. Just like all the chemistry that we've been talking about throughout this entire book. It's got to take place in a liquid medium. So we start by adding some liquid to the digestive process. We're going to talk about accessory organs of the digestive system. Things like teeth and the tongue, salivary glands. As we move lower down, we're going to talk about things like the liver and the pancreas. All of these guys are going to add things to the digestive system, the tube, to break things down for us. So the process itself involves this large tube where we bring things in, ingest food, then we break them down. Now we break them down in a couple ways. We can mechanically break them down, and what's that doing? What do I do when I mechanically break down my, I chew it. Where else do I mechanically break it down? In the stomach. Most of it happens in the stomach. Some of it happens in the mouth. I pull it apart. I make it smaller. At that point, I'm also going to add things to it right from the beginning. I'm going to add some moisture. I'm going to add some ions. I'm going to add some enzymes. Did you know your saliva contained enzymes? Yeah. What kind of enzymes? Digestive enzymes. Mm-hmm. Like what? Anybody know? If I hold, I'll give you an example. If I take a piece of bread and I put it in my mouth, 
and I hold it in there for a long, long, long time. And most of us can't do that. It ends up dissolving and we end up swallowing it. But I mean, if we were able to do that, what would the bread start tasting like? Sugar. Sugar. Because what's in my saliva? An enzyme that's going to help me break down carbohydrates. Now we're going back to your chemistry brain. Last semester, chapter two. <gasps> I had to remember I that crap. Like that. Wow. What are carbohydrates made of? Sugars, simple sugars, yes. And mono is one. Poly is many. Disaccharides are two, yes? So some of you might have put some disaccharides into your coffee this morning. What's a disaccharide that you might have put in your coffee? Yeah, table sugar. What's, what is it a combination of? Glucose and? And fructose. Yes. That's sucrose, which is table sugar. Yep, disaccharide. We have to break it down into what in order for us to use it? We can't use it as sucrose. Too big. We have to break it down into glucose and fructose, which are two simple sugars. Who's going to do that? Enzymes, like who? Amylase. So when we hit that second part of the chapter, you're going to see that chart. And that chart is going to show you all of the chemicals. It's on page... Oi, oi, oi. It's on page 893 in your textbook. So you're going to see all the different enzymes associated with um, 893. Those are the different enzymes associated with breaking down all of the different organic molecules into their building blocks. Because remember, I can't use them big. I got to take them all apart. Like I go to lunch, I have a cheeseburger. I'm not a cheeseburger. But I need to build. No, I'm not, even though sometimes I might resemble a cheeseburger. But I'm not a cheeseburger. But I need all the building blocks, yes? So what do I have to break the cheeseburger down into? Well, I have to break it down into its building block. For the proteins, what do I need to break it down into? Uh, amino, acids. amino acids. For the carbohydrates, I need to break it down into simple sugars, monosaccharides. For the nucleic acids, <gasps> I'm really testing the brain cells. What's a nucleic acid? Give me an example. DNA. DNA. What's it made of? What's it made of? You just said it big, that's all. What's a nucleic acid made of? I'll give you a hint. No salt. Nitrogenous base. Nucleotides. Adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine. Name something you eat that doesn't have DNA in it. didn't come with DNA, associated with DNA. Sugar's made from who? Um, oh, plants. Uh, high fructose crapola syrup. You gotta stop drinking that stuff, it's not good for you. What else? It's like salt. Maybe that's the only thing I can think of on the top of my head that wasn't alive before I ate it. Yes? <laughs> we don't eat the table. Oh, what are we eating? Oh, McDonald's. <laughs> I know. You've got to take nutrition class, then we'll pick on you then. Meal's already been through that. So, 
these are all the building blocks you need and you need to break down large to small because I need those building blocks we forgot one we don't want to forget lipids what are lipids made of fats. lipids are fats what are they made of Glycerol and the head. I'm thinking of the head and the tails. Yes. The tails are who? Phosphate. No. It's it's an F word. Yes, I know. Phospholipids. No. That's a fat. The pH word. No, it's not a pH word, it's an F word. Fatty acids. So that's the goal. That's the goal of the digestive system. Break it down into the small parts so I can use them at a cellular level. So I intake ingestion. I have to push the food through the tube as we go along, breaking larger things down into smaller things. That's propulsion. So I'm going to propel food from my mouth when I swallow it down the tube. Yes? Good. Like the sound effect? Who's going to help me do that? Yeah. <laughs> no, not the whole system. <clears throat> so I swallow with the tongue, which is a muscle, accessory organ to the digestive system, that's going to push that chewed up food and spit down the tube. That's going to be propelled. Does food just fall from your mouth to your stomach? <clears throat> no. It has to be pushed. Propelled, smooth muscles through who? The esophagus. So the esophagus is next. Then we put food into the stomach. It's the same tube, it just got a little wider. And what we're going to see is the tube is kind of kind of change as it goes along. We're going to have the same basic parts of the tube, but the inside of the tube and the and the job of that part of the tube is going to change as we go along. We get to the stomach, we're going to add more chemicals. We're actually going to, believe it or not, add acid. What's that going to continue to do? Break it apart. So not only do we have chemical digestion, but we still have mechanical digestion happening in the stomach. So when food falls into the stomach, we're going to add some more chemicals and we're going to keep squishing it up. Once I've gotten the right mix, food's going to then go from the stomach to the what? the small intestine. How many feet of small intestine do you have? About 20, 21 feet of small intestine. So if I take my small intestines out here, I can throw it and hit the TV. <laughs> That's a lot of small intestine, yes? yes? Why do you think there's so much? Because it takes a while to break down. Because you're going to continue to break things down. We're going to see stuff is going to get added, more chemicals before I hit the small intestine. but the small intestine itself is going to keep adding chemicals to continue to break down food. There's a lot of chemicals in small intestine. Yeah, there's a lot. And what else is going to happen very important in the small intestine? Don't think we get absorption. That's where we're going to start to absorb things. When you dissect your pigs at the end of the semester, one of the things I want you the whole pig. It's a baby pig. <laughs> One of the things you have to pay close attention to is the small intestine. Because when you remove the small intestine and you look at the membranes surrounding, holding the small intestine in, they're called the mesentery, you're going to see tons and tons and tons of blood vessels. So very highly vascular because I'm absorbing the food that I am breaking down into the small intestine. The other thing I want you to notice when you dissect your, your baby pig, besides the blood vessels there in the mesentery, you're going to see all these little dots, lymphatic system. What was the other job of the lymphatic system besides all of the bringing stuff in, fluid stuff? What else does it bring in for you? Water absorption and something else. Oh. Think digestive system now. Lipids, exactly. You're going to absorb lipids in through the lymphatic system first, through the digestive system. Where is then the lipids going to be delivered to? 
circulatory system exactly. So that's another thing that the lymphatic system is important for. When we take a close look at the histology of the small intestine and we look at the villi and the vessels associated with it, we're going to see capillaries, but we're also going to see lymphatic vessels. They're called lacteals. And this is where lipids are going to be absorbed kind of indirectly into the circulatory system. Lipids are big, huge molecules, and those little flaps that the lymphatic system has allows them to be incorporated into fluids and eventually go to the circulatory so system. Cisterna chile or chile? Cisterna chile. Oh, chile. Okay. That's kind of a combination of. Tube. Well, it's not a lymph node. Basically, it's one of the, the major lymphatic vessels. So everybody, especially the intestines, are going to feed in to that, and that's going to continue to go up and distribute lymph fluid into the circulatory system. So once, say I'm, say I'm following lymph fluid from my lower extremities. Once I hit the cisterna chile, what's going to happen to the composition of lymph? What, what, what it's made of. Any ideas? It's going to be right outside the intestine. There's more fluid. Not more fluid. Well, yeah, more fluid, but more what in my fluid? A lot more fat because we're going to get it from the small intestine. So we're going to see the composition of lymph once it hits that point is going to become much more fat con higher in fat content. Let me um, take attendance, and then you can adios.